Welcome to the Dark Ozarks. We are discussing the Oklahoma Ozarks. Yes, there are Oklahoma Ozarks. We will get back to that in a minute, but first we want to remind you that the Dark Ozarks podcast is now available on Branson Podcast Network, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, Substack, or about any other podcast platform. So are there more differences between the Oklahoma Ozarks and the Eastern Ozarks than there are points in common? I think that most people will find more similarities overall from the fact that it was such a rugged territory and a place to lose yourself from trouble to the character of the people who made it home, to the legends, and to the dark history. We will return to the part of the Ozarks you may not have known even existed, but first we want to invite you to like, follow, and subscribe to Dark Ozarks on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, as well as your favorite podcast platforms. We also invite you to become a Dark Ozarks subscriber on Facebook. On the Dark Ozarks Facebook page, click subscribe, have your login information ready, and join Dark Ozarks behind the scenes for only $4.99 per month. Your $4.99 per month Facebook subscription allows you to come with us on paranormal investigations, deep dive research, and topics too controversial for public view. The next 100 subscribers will be entered in a drawing for a free Dark Ozarks t-shirt and an exclusive signed first drawing copy of the book, Dark Ozarks, The Spook Light. Subscribe today to be entered in the drawing. And now you can get Dark Ozarks t-shirts for sale at darkozarks.com and paranormalsciencelab.com. We encourage you to check out Always Buying Books in Joplin, Missouri, in person and online, on Facebook and at the website, alwaysbuyingbooks.com for all of your reading needs, including a large section on the paranormal history and more. Not to mention, the building is haunted. Tell Bob and Elise that we sent you. We also want to thank Beard Engine Brewing Company in Alba, Missouri. Beard Engine Brewing is the only English style brewer brewery in Missouri and has been twice named Missouri's best brewery by the Missouri Brewers Association. Great beer and great food in a historical building with a noir past. And yes, their building is also haunted. Tell Nate and Tiff that we sent you. Oh, lots of ghosts. But of course, lots of ghosts. it is the Dark Ozark, so that comes with the territory. But it might come also as a surprise to some that uh, for some reason, the, uh, the Ozark Mountain Plateau does not stop at the Missouri and Arkansas state line. That's right. Yes, Virginia. <laughs> the Ozarks are in Oklahoma too. Uh, and, uh, and a good chunk, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about a, a very rugged continuation of the upland plateau of the Ozarks extending mm-hmm. over into the Tahlequah area. And that ruggedness combined with some uh, socio-historical mm, features really combined to make the Oklahoma Ozarks a phenomenal place to hide out in in some cases even longer than uh, the, than was the case with the Missouri and Arkansas Ozarks. True and in, in a very real sense uh, a number ran, uh, ran that direction to get out of trouble they got into in those parts here (laughs) (laughs) they they did and there are of course stories of Mm. at least one uh christian county bald knobber uh escaping from the christian county jail and disappearing and disappearing into into indian territory which later became oklahoma that happened that happened you know quite a bit actually and um and people might be surprised that uh, um, what is now Oklahoma and what was Indian Territory was, it, it in many ways was sort of quote a no man's land um, because the really the only real law enforcement for a very long time was out of uh, Fort Smith and right. Arkansas and. Mm-hmm. Uh, all of the U.S. Marshals would, the U.S. Marshals uh, were in charge of most of law enforcement in the territory. And um, so they would 
have to go over there from Fort Smith and um, actually quite a few really legends and uh, uh, compelling stories came out of that. Probably um, one that a lot of people are familiar with, of course, is Judge Isaac Parker, who um, um, in about 1879 was a uh, uh, assigned to the Western District of Arkansas and charged with basically cleaning up, <laughs> cleaning up the the territory. <laughs> that that he was and that he did, and <clears throat> it's it's interesting for me, of course, to look at many of these characters and and uh, and personalities that certainly at the time were larger than life personalities that then became mythic folk heroes in the 20th century due mm -hmm. to their essentially reincarnation as uh, as almost fictional characters on the, typically on the big screen. That's true, very, very, very much so. And um, uh, Westerns in particular visited a lot of these characters and um, Judge Parker was no uh, exception, <laughs> probably most prominently in Hang 'em High with Clint Eastwood. Um, very, very true. And we also, you know, we're we're going to talk about John Wayne a couple of times on this yeah. this particular episode. But uh, I can't help but mm, pull this book off from my coffee table. Uh, true Grit by Charles Portis. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> it's uh, one of my favorite novels. And of course, it, it really deals with those, mm, those essentially social, historical, and political factors that you, you cross the, mm, at the time, uh, before the creation of Oklahoma as a state, you crossed the... Uh, the, the Arkansas state line into Indian Territory, the Missouri state line into Indian Territory, things changed dramatically. From a legal standpoint, what was that dynamic that they were basically looking at at that time? Well, um, for one thing, they it, it was not a it was not a state; it was a territory. So the basically it was governed much more loosely, but by the federal government, uh, not as hands on, and Basically, the for all it, all intents and purposes, the the only people with authority to do anything were the U.S. Marshals, the federal judge, and the military. Mm -hmm. So and that's that's a pretty thin scattering of officials, considering the scope of the land involved. Right, and then you had then you had tri uh, tribal lands um, that um, uh, began in the 1830s. So some of those areas, um, it was a little even more murky because you had tribal oversight. But for certain things, they they sometimes cooperated, sometimes didn't with the military, uh, etc. So often outlaws would would try to if depending on who they got along with they would try to lose themselves on tribal land because then it was even harder for them to be found mm -hmm. um but um uh, we think of we 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 know names from this time period of outlaws uh, but uh we don't know as many of the of the lawmen um, in the Indian Territory, we do other, you know, Kansas and Missouri and so forth. You know, like Bat Masterson and Wyatt Earp, people like that. But um, probably um, the most interesting, uh, interesting U.S. Marshal was Bass Reeves. And that is, yeah, that's a that's a very fair assessment. And a very, very compelling story. I mean, he was born a slave. He was illiterate um, and ended up in Oklahoma and uh, ended up 
becoming a U.S. Marshal, and um, he would he would memorize the warrants. He he would memorize what they looked like and everything, but he technically couldn't read. And he had the best um, track record of bringing in his men. Actually, he brought in every man he was sent to to get. Which is very impressive. Very, very impressive. And um, including his own son. Wow. Um, he, uh, he was very rigorous in his ideas of right and wrong. And uh, his son, um, in a fit of anger, uh, uh, had ended up killing his wife uh, when he found out she was having an affair with, with another man. And um, a warrant was issued. And so they, they let him know and uh, they let Bass know that his son, you know, that this warrant was there and um, because they didn't want him to be shot. And, and he said, well, if anyone's going to bring him in, it's going to be me. And he brought him in and he stood trial and he ended up um, being convicted and I think served life in prison. Mm. That's impressive. Overall, everything is. And <clears throat> was Reeves op essentially operating out of Fort Smith? Yes, yes. Um, later, um, after he retires as a U.S. Marshal, he he uh, worked as a lawman. Um, I, I want to say he was in Claremore for a while, mm -hmm. uh, but he was he was pretty elderly at that point. Um, and if, if I remember right, losing his eyesight, but um, before he retired. But what people may not know is you know his you know you know his story as you said from the big screen because he is the inspiration um oh i hate it when i just go blank <laughs> for the lone ranger <laughs> i'll think of it a minute is it is it the lone ranger <laughs> yes the lone ranger yep that's yeah. what I was thinking. I was, is, uh, and but I, I think it's it is fascinating and incredibly powerful and in, an, an unfortunate commentary that most people wouldn't be able to draw that through line from a historical mm -hmm. perspective. That's true, and and um, and particularly, you know, being African American, um, but. Um, yeah, uh, Bass Reeves is quite quite the inspiration, and um, so it, it's interesting as we talk through some some of this history tonight. We're going to talk about a lot of outlaws, so you have to kind of <laughs> balance that. You have, you know, Isaac Parker, the Hanging Judge, um, and Bass Reeves, as opposed to some of the, these other things. So you you had huge personalities and uh, on both sides. You really did. And, and essentially mythic heroes and folk heroes and individuals who probably without their, um, even their imagining impacted uh, American culture several generations later that they couldn't have conceived of as, a, as that level. And some of them probably would probably be pretty ticked off that they didn't get any merchandising rights. <laughs> yes, that certainly uh, way way before uh, George Lucas uh, came up with that brilliant uh, move for Star Wars. Oh, it's just uh, actually just watching E.T. over the weekend. <laughs> uh, speaking of merchandising, some of the extended DVD information had a. Uh, a series of slides showing toys inspired by the movie. And I was a little embarrassed on how many of them I recognized from my, from my childhood. And it is what it is. <laughs> I know. And the, the aspects is, is a little bit of, you've already hinted at, but um, uh, an enormous number of, uh, uh, of African-Americans may 
found uh, a home at, at various times in in the uh, in the Oklahoma Ozarks and in Oklahoma, mm-hmm. and, and uh, in African American uh, culture and uh, and folk culture as well had uh, really really important influences on the development of the state and on the eastern region as well as the fact and we've been mentioned several times prior to oklahoma statehood which i believe was 1907 it was uh indian territory and specifically named as the because uh with the removal the federal removal of uh of tribes from ancestral lands in the east Oklahoma became the place that they were sent. Yes. Uh, and and in part because that was just past the edge of quote civilized you know civilization as, as things started to go further mm-hmm. west. So it, very it, very much so and you know the the consistent the um Mm, and consistent federal negotiation of uh, moving Native Americans to locations that were quote unquote uncivilized because those areas were not going to be exploited yet um, in terms of white settlement. And then as soon as uh, white settlement mm, began to encroach on those areas, then we find a new area uh, to remove, and uh, we we thought that particularly dance over and over here in our or in my region of uh, the Missouri Ozarks, with uh, <clears throat> particularly the uh, the relocation of the Delaware and the Kickapoo tribes, uh, among others, but those being the the dominant ones. But of course, the mm, the removal of the Osage first, so that the Delaware could be moved in, and then the mm-hmm. removal of the Delaware. Uh, so to the uh, white settlers could be moved in, and the then of course the uh, the the most notable the 1830s uh, forced march um, of the of the Cherokee on multiple trails of the Trail of Tears, which uh, had again those those multiple pathways or routes led. Uh, through Arkansas, through Missouri, and and uh, and terminated in modern day Oklahoma. Yes, and 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 also during that same period, um, a lot of people might not realize that during as that was happening, that march was happening in the mid eighteen thirties. It also coincided with uh, several years of drought and. Uh, bad game uh, years for the Osage who had already been relocated to Oklahoma and Kansas, what became Kansas. Um, And so literally as that relocation of of the civilized uh, tribes is going to Indian territory, uh, the Osage actually pushed back into Southwest Missouri and there was a war in Southwest Missouri. uh, fought with the military, uh, including on the square in Carthage, Missouri. That is all but forgotten. Mm-hmm. That the conflict is all but forgotten, and very, very fascinating. In, in tragic, really. I mean, when you look at the the movements of people, and then fast forward actually to Oklahoma becoming a state, all the way into. You know, comparatively, you know, I'd say comparatively recent times, 100 years ago, uh, in the 1920s, I'm still wrapping my head around the fact that it is the 2020s. I personally think that it's almost 1999, but, <laughs> and I am 17, but I'm not and it's not. And uh, in the 1920s, <clears throat> a very interesting dynamic, which I think will, will, dig into a little bit later but just as a, as a note uh early on in the episode is that <clears throat> that similar theme of 
moving various tribes, uh, various Native American tribal groups into certain areas that were unwanted uh, until that land became wanted. Mm -hmm. And then finding new and uh, um, unnervingly intricate ways to uh, separate the uh, the people from the land yet again. And in the 1920s, we saw a, a renewed attempt uh, after the discovery of oil in on Osage tribal lands that had been established previously after the Osage had been mm, removed from their ancestral lands several times already. Yes. Basically, they had finally been relocated to a, a part of Oklahoma that ironically had uh, one of the richest oil deposits in the world under it. And when oil was discovered, um, in fact, uh, Chief Lookout uh, worried that, that it would actually you know, put his people more in danger, uh, make, make their uh, future more insecure than secure, and ironically, in some ways, he was right. Um, and um, a, a couple of things: one, one was pure greed, and another was um, that suddenly you had the Osage. Many of the tribal members become extremely wealthy, and um, of course, as happens. Generally, when that happened, some really flaunted their wealth, and that caused a lot of jealousy. And um, so, uh, the way that the allotments um, and and the rights were uh, written, and it was actually the most intricate um, uh, arrangement um, of any tribe, and in some ways was designed to try to protect their interests, but basically if a tribal member intermarried with a non-tribal member and they died, their interest went to the spouse. Um, and so ultimately what happened is you had a number of tribal members who had intermarried with whites, white settlers, and then um, a series of murders occurred in the 1920s of over 200 tribal members in basically efforts to obtain those rights. Um, the FBI got involved and uh, it was actually um, one of the seminal cases that um, J. Edgar Hoover used to justify the expansion of the FBI. Well, and it's, <clears throat> when, you, when you combine the high number uh, of murders, first of all, in a comparatively small region with a comparatively sparse population, we're, we're dealing with um, a, a St a statistically significant percentage of the population that was getting killed and well yeah i mean even were, today in a, in a much more populated area i mean it, it, today if, if that many people died in that uh by murder in that uh, period of time i think it was about a year um mm -hmm. in say tulsa which is close to a half million people that statistically would be a significant spike even today yeah so you, you think about just how devastating this was to the, the people of that region and the, the manner in which the murders took place were uh, awful. I mean, it was yeah. uh, extremely varied as well in the, in the sense that it was just find um, unique ways to kill these people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It, it it seemed to be done in a way to mass to maximize uh, terrorizing mm -hmm. yeah. people. It, area. It, it really does appear that psychological warfare is is part of it, and and it, and of course there's this incredibly significant 
uh, moment historically for the Osage people. And of course, as you mentioned, uh, this was uh, uh, a situation in the, in the history of the nation that uh, that Hoover, uh, J. Edgar Hoover, you know, utilized to expand the FBI. Ultimately, what was the the overall outcome? Well, um, I mean, there there were there were um, there were trials. That, some were found guilty. Um, uh, there were a lot of efforts to try to cover it up, you know, by certain people. Um, people were appalled. Um, uh, but it, it, it was a huge story, but I don't think it was as huge of a story as it probably would have been now. Um, um, but ultimately the intervention did in the murders, but, um, and the, uh, oil rights stayed in place. Um, but it's something that still, you know, lingers to this day as a, you know, as a, uh, a shared trauma for those age people. And it, <clears throat> one, of, one of the references for tonight, it's a, uh, a uh, summer 1995 article by Renard Strickland, Osage Oil, Mineral Law, Murder, Mayhem, and Manipulation. And in that, there was, there was a really interesting quote, the Osage continued to struggle with a system originally designed to strip them of their resources. And mm -hmm. that was that was penned in 1995. Mm -hmm. I just, I found that really, really fascinating. Yeah, and then there's a there's a more recent book that um, uh, about the murders of the Moonflower people, which is another name for the Osage. That's the the book is about four or five years old, I'd say now. Written by a New York Times reporter, it was very good. And actually, um, it was the basis of the movie that um, was just filmed there last year. I don't think it's been released yet. Uh, but uh, I know Brendan Fraser's in it, I'm, and I can't remember who all's in it. But um, actually, some several you know, uh, A-list stars are in it, so hopefully, it is a good telling of the story. I would, I would hope so. And generally speaking, I would assume that it is. I, I would, I would say so. Um, I, I don't know any particulars. You know, but if it's faithful to the book, then it should be. Oh, one of one of tonight's topics in regards to Oklahoma that uh, I, I found really really fascinating is the term "social bandit." <laughs> yes, yes, I did too. Um, but when you think about it, it, it it's pretty apropos. Um, and it, it, it fits a lot of outlaws and bandits in the arts. And to be honest, um, pretty, there, there are a handful out West, but I would say that category pretty much was kind of the, in this region more than anywhere else. Very much so. I mean, we, we see, Essentially, in terms of uh, mm, mythic folklore of, of Western civilization, we have Robin Hood, and then we go straight to Jesse James. Jesse James, and then the Dalton Gang, and, and so on and so forth. And, you know, people may be going, what's a social bandit? No, it's not that they're friendly, although certainly, certainly a lot of people talked about how charismatic the James brothers could be. So um. <laughs> it is definitely in terms of, of um, it's, it's difficult for me to mm, make any contemporary comparisons with certainly in the United States with um, our admittedly not exhaustive list, but still our list of notable um, outlaws that 
not only achieved some level of mythic status even during their lives, but were mm, lightning rod figures largely based on their regional popularity. Mm -hmm. I mean, you I mean, even when you get to the Depression era, um, you get that a little bit, but not really during the time period so much. Um, uh, the closest would be Bonnie and Clyde, and, and that is a lightning rod because some people just view them, you know, as hardened criminals and they shouldn't be, quote, glorified. Um, but they did have that social bandit aspect, and part of that is that of their popularity uh, of, of the population, the area, and being protected and so forth. And they did have that. Um, in areas, particularly in northeast Oklahoma, they did. And the the other the other person that really comes to mind is Pretty Boy Floyd. Yes, um, that that is true. And Pretty Boy Floyd was everywhere, all over the Ozarks uh, in Missouri and Oklahoma. Um, and um, and he he gets a bit of that mystique. Um, not only from sort of being a you know, homegrown boy uh, and being protected by people, but also in large part for the question marks of, was he involved in this crime? Was he involved in that crime? Yes, we maybe yes, maybe no. Everything from the Kansas City massacre to the Young Brothers ma you know, massacre. Um, was he there or not? We don't really know. And, and again, speaking to the, just the far reaching aspects, <clears throat> and we see this with, um, with Jesse James, we see this with Pretty Boy Floyd in particular, uh, and, and also of course with Bonnie and, and Clyde, but the, mm, the, the incredible power of a fast horse and several decades later, uh, a fast car mm -hmm. were, Mm, I, I think uh, an informing part of the mythos, but it, it reminds me, of course, a lot of my family is from Southern Iowa, which is vastly removed, you know, from the from the Ozarks in terms of just distance. And to this day, I believe to this day, certainly during my growing up years, uh, the county seat of Wayne County, Iowa, uh, Corden. <clears throat> would celebrate Jesse James days every summer because Jesse James had robbed a bank there uh, during during his during those days and uh, actually reading a book a couple of years ago or two years now ago now reading a, a great uh, incredibly well researched book on Centerville Iowa uh, over the entire history of the of the county really of Avenues County and surrounding environs mentioned uh, the, the mm, reasonably well-documented reality that Pretty Boy Floyd and one of his uh, um, friends had uh, stolen a car and then abandoned it because it caught fire, I think, um, on, a, on a particular road not far from uh, Numa and Jerome, Iowa, the particular corner next to a cemetery, and uh, had left the, the car on top of the hill. That specific location described is in front of my sister's farm. <laughs> See, that's, you know, you know, those are, those are such interesting, you know, stories of the fact that, you know, you have a direct connection, you know, um, and they're, and that happens in the Ozarks everywhere with people who, that there were connections with Bonnie and Clyde or Jesse James. Um, we've been told stories at events by people, you know, family members, you know, handed down the stories of the, you know, one of them coming to a house or uh, Bonnie and Clyde, you know, partying at a jute joint on the river in Oklahoma, you know. Um, and, uh, I think it is it, and I, a point that was made in, in, in 
in the research material, which is very interesting, is that this sort of milieu of the social bandit really only exists in America, aside from the Robin Hood myth, which of course the Robin Hood myth took close to a thousand years to be fleshed out. It um, did, and, and had a number of editors along the way. And lots of twists and turns to it too. <laughs> and, and with our with our American outlaws, we're we're not dealing with with centuries of fabricated story. We're dealing with uh, individuals that much of their lives have been clearly documented. Um, mm -hmm. Many aspects of their lives were were you know, associated with first person accounts, not only in front of themselves, but also lots of, of individuals in the Ozarks, uh, elsewhere also, but Arkansas, uh, not our, uh, Oklahoma Ozarks, Missouri Ozarks in particular, some in Arkansas. And it really follows through, there's a through line of the, the, the hallmarks of what I think to many of us simply makes sense you you look at the lives that they led their reasons for doing things there's a vicariousness that is involved there's a common sense element that is involved there's a an element that many everyday americans law-abiding americans would look at the actions of some of these gangs and go you know in my situation either i do that or you know if i was in their situation i would do that or if I was in their situation, I hope I would do that. Yeah. And, you know, that's that's one of those things that, too, um, the time period that these things happen, you had relatively little law enforcement, um, uh, relatively less social more enforcement, you know, peer pressure, um, and in part because of rugged territory and sparse populations, etc. And so the, even though America has always, and even during that time period, prided itself on being law and order and, you know, um, st stable, etc., that time period and this part of the country, because of those factors, um, what was just and upright and moral um, not only was fuzzy, but it, it was very situational. It was. <clears throat> there was a, a, a lot of distrust of law enforcement when there was law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And there was, it, it was an interesting note. Um, and of course, we're, we're referencing many cases in this situation, not all for tonight, but uh, Outlaw Gangs of the Middle Border, uh, published in Western Historical Quarterly in 1981. And a lot of distrust of, of uh, local law and a lot of blurring the lines in particular, we're talking about Oklahoma in particular, a lot of blurring the lines uh, between um, survival um, and essentially banditry, um, rustlers, et cetera, in, in, in ways that would probably be shocking to some people now, but it came down, I think, to the fact that in some cases, if you were uh, going to uh, choose between rustling cattle that presumably based on the size of some of the herds that the um, the herd owners would likely not miss or be able to trace as opposed to being able to feed your family. Those types of very basic elements. Exactly. And here, a good example um, that kind of illustrates all of this and actually very much ties you know, those arts together with all this is Wyatt Earp in mm -hmm. his early days. Wyatt Earp started out, uh, his, fr his first uh, law enforcement job was in Lamar, Missouri. And uh, in 1869, he was 21 years old. 
and uh, his father had been a, a marshal. Um, uh, they were at this point very stable. His brother owned a grocery store in town, etc. And then basically circumstances intervened and his bride of only a few months dies. Um, he ends up leaving town under a cloud of suspicion of, of uh, embezzlement <laughs> and promptly goes to Oak Indian Territory where he and a couple other fellas um, basically steal horses yeah. and get arrested, taken to Fort Smith. Um, and, um, well, actually not Fort Smith, uh, but, um, where was the, the court before? Because literally they're arrested a few months as they're getting ready to move the, the court to Fort Smith. And I'm trying to think, so Mountain Home maybe? And um, he escapes. Um, and then goes to Kansas and and um, then to, back to Illinois and, and gets arrested gambling and with prostitution and so forth for a few times before then becoming a lawman again. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's a good illustration of, you know, your heroes aren't always, you know, just, you know, white hats, et cetera. And also on the social bandit aspect of it, Lamar has, you know, officially forgiven Wyatt Earp for any transgressions of stealing uh, because they they celebrate Wyatt Earp days every September. Which I, I'm just I'm just wrapping my head around on on the the eve of mm, Earp leaving. Lamar for the first time, if someone had beamed into that moment from the future and said, by the way, you're going to be a, a not only a cultural hero, but they're going to celebrate you with a festival every year. I wonder what his <laughs> response would have been. <laughs> exactly. It's a good illustration of, of, of this idea. Um, um, and, you know, maybe, and, and I have to wonder if part of it is part of being such a young country, um, and that, not and, yeah, and not I, being I, able to rely on you know eons of mythology. That's a good point uh, because <laughs> you know while while certain aspects of folklore were being built up around real and imagined people. Uh, and certainly there was a, an aspect of mythologizing from the top down in terms of uh, um, George Washington to obviously Abraham Lincoln, um, and, you know, individual Daniel Boone, Davy Crockett, uh, over into a more mm, mythic aspects, uh, Johnny Appleseed, um, over into uh, you know Paul Bunyan and Babe the Blue Ox, so on and so forth. I, I think there was something deeply resonant about the Dalton Gang, about the James Gang, that would really speak to a different, mm, speak in a different way to the American story and to the American, the the soul of the American people. That you know we. You, you look at some of the, for example, the, uh, the far north woods uh, mythos and, and lore. Yes, it's fun. You look at what Washington Irving wrote in terms of uh, you know, various tales. It's fun. It's spooky. It, it creates a sense of place. You look at some of the mm, varying generations of, uh, of top-down American mythos with uh, with Washington and Lincoln and there with those uh you know and, and ultimately the establishment of President's Day and generation after generation of um school children being forced to cut things out of um uh, paper in terms of silhouettes and hanging them and <laughs> not saying I was scarred by that but maybe I was anyway um 
my, Certainly. <laughs> my, my top hat, my, my, uh, my uh, um, construction paper top hats never came out right. But <laughs> <laughs> it came from the land of Lincoln. There was a lot of demand here in terms of continuation. Lots of pressure. Lots of pressure, <laughs> lots of pressure in first grade in February <laughs> to do terrible weather. And, uh, February in Illinois is not a fun time. There's a reason I moved to the Ozark, but I'm not remotely bitter. I'm just saying that <laughs> I'm not scarred by the experience. Uh, but I think that there is something very mm, akin to more in the in the realm of i would say fair to uh, on the on the spectrum with uh <laughs> with babe the blue ox being at the extreme and george washington being in the center i think as we're moving moving westward we start to see um folk heroes in the terms of uh of davy crockett uh folk heroes in the terms of uh uh, honestly, uh, Old Hickory, Andrew Jackson, and mm -hmm. Bowie, people like that. Very much so that that there is a grounding, and of course, there's mm, this uh, cultural roller coaster between how how individuals saw them at the time, into seeing them created into these uh, heroic. Uh, figures, particularly through uh, comparatively modern media into pop culture in the 20th century, and then their mm, uh, you know deconstruction in the latter part of the 20th century into the early 21st century to say, oh, those people that you thought were so heroic, here's 16 reasons why they didn't uh, weren't. Uh, please insert clickbait page here. Uh, mm -hmm. those types of things and, and long dissertations on why all of the American heroes that we came to believe were heroes are not heroes, etc. And I think that there's a, uh, an injection of reality with the James gang, with the Dalton brothers, you know, then the, and the Dalton Doolin gang that, and, and I would say also with pretty boy Floyd, um, it just in terms of, they 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 didn't need although they certainly in the curse of Jesse James they have the movies um, but they didn't need the movies at the time they were they were heroes they were folk heroes right at the time uh, and in large part based on the actions and the decisions that they were making while being outlaws. Mm -hmm. Well, and a good example of that would be specifically the James brothers. Um, Frank, after Jesse was killed, um, about a year later, he um, he turned himself in, and um, he literally walked into the governor's office without anyone recognizing him, etc. Walks into um, um the governor's outer office and there's 15 clerks working and finally a young lady asked you know so can i help you and he says i i i, I would like to speak with, with the governor and she says can i have your name to tell him who's here and he just said frank james and then everyone went ah and <laughs> And ran out of the room and uh of course he he goes in and he you know surrenders gives you know surrenders his gun uh in the first time in over 20 years and tells him tells the governor that it was the first time he'd had allowed another man to touch his gun since 1861 <laughs> and um um then later after the show trial etc which we've covered in other episodes um he tried to settle down to a quiet life um and remarkably there were only two known examples where he kind of used his name in any way uh he, he tried to avoid that but people didn't allow him really 
at one point, you know, to make money, uh, a um, department store in Dallas, Texas, hired him to be a shoe salesman. And they're, they did it to, they thought, well, people will come in because they want to see, you know, what Frank James really looks like and everything. And, and he's was more mild mannered, very articulate, very, you know, um, his personality was a, a bit different than Jesse's. And the story goes that um, uh, actually it, it, they had so many people try to come in and they ended up tearing up the store over time that they let Frank go because it was costing them more money and damages <laughs> than sales. But while he worked there, there was a uh, apparently a, this uh, uh, town bully there in, in Dallas that was had quite a name for himself and came in and he wanted boots. And so he, you know, was being um, helped by this, you know, this mild mannered salesman and tried on a pair, told him what, what he wanted. They, he brings them and doesn't like that. And they go through about 12 pairs and, and the guy starts getting irate and said, you, you know, can't you bring me a, a good pair of boots? And he says, well, sir, I think, I think that's a good pair of boots you have on there. And, and he, and he said, really, do you know who you're, you're talking to? And he said, no. And he tells him his name and he goes, well, I, I'm sorry. I don't know, don't know you, sir, but I still think that's a good pair of boots do you know who you're talking to? And uh, he said, no. And he said, Frank James. And the fellow replied with, I do think those are a good pair of boots and bought them. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the only other time that's, uh, you know, record that I've found or um, that uh, he kind of used his name was uh, um, at one point, he and his wife, I forget where they were living and, and people had figured out that it was him. And so neighborhood children would come and knock on the door and ring the bell constantly trying to get him to answer the door. So he put a piece of paper above the doorbell that said, this is the house of Frank James. And um, no one rang the bell after that. <laughs> but it, it did, to me, it illustrates that that milieu of social bandit really did exist for those things to happen. It did, and uh, and you know, going to come back to this Richard White article for just a moment. Um, I, I love I love this paragraph. Given social conditions in Oklahoma and Missouri, there was a decisive allure in strong men who defended themselves, righted their own wrongs, and took vengeance on their enemies despite the corruption of the existing order. Such virtues were of more than nostalgic interest in praising bandits. Supporters admired them more for their attributes than their acts. Bandits were brave, daring, free, shrewd, and tough, yet also loyal, gentle, generous, and polite. They were not common criminals. Yes, well, and 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 there, there was a lot of reality to that with with a number of them, particularly the James brothers and the and the younger brothers, because they they came from means and um quote of the time quote good families um and we're cousins by the way so um <laughs> you know so they they were not seen even in their time even in the early days as you know sort of com petty thieves common thieves and <clears throat> i think that it, there's a mm, of course, the, the 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 article makes mention, and it's it's interesting um, because I, and I it, it makes mention of first of all, were they some sort of you know socialist reform uh, fighting for the the new American peasantry that largely gets dismissed in the sense that that really was not the the perspective of the of the times. It was not the perspective of the individuals who were being outlaws at the times. Uh, there was one uh, one uh, sort of academic accusation that uh, the surrounding countryside pretended to be supportive of the gang because they were afraid of them. That really doesn't hold up in terms of contemporary literature. No. Um, maybe isolated individuals might have been if they were at odds politically, but 
overall no, no. but areas that they had strongholds in shared worldviews and <clears throat> there's the 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 common the common theme that really appears to resonate is that they're <laughs> for lack of a better term they're well-mannered and polite and gregarious banditry really reflected a a rugged individualism that was popular and was a an expression of what we would even today consider to be uh, a perhaps mythic but still American ideal oh definitely um you and you still see it in in um advertising and and uh, entertainment today it's just you're not on a horse or <laughs> robbing a train i mean it's um it is sort of a characteristics that are viewed as admirable um i think the american psyche is well it's great if it if uh you have these characteristics and in, in and you aren't committing crimes but if you if you are committing crimes for the right reasons we still admire it mm -hmm. and in a in a seemingly contradictory way it, it adds to the street cred <laughs> literally yes <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the ardmore oklahoma state herald uh, had this contemporary statement to make uh, in regards to the Doolin Dalton gang. Uh, their life is made up of daring. Their courage is always with them and their rifles as well. They are kind to the benighted traveler, and it is not a fiction that when robbing a train, they refuse to take from a woman. It is said that Bill Doolin, at present the reigning highwayman, is friendly to the people in one neighborhood, best doing all sorts of presents upon the children. It is his boast that he never killed a man. This is as fully a romantic figure as Robin Hood ever cut, end quote. And ironically, you know, the um, Bill Dalton um, admired and envied Jesse James, which, of course, who had much the similar uh, reputation. And, of course, the demise of the of the Dalton gang or most of the Dalton gang was because specifically they they were determined to do what Jesse James did not accomplish in Northfield, Minnesota. Yes. And <laughs> ended up similar um, result and actually worse numbers lost. Um, but um, so yeah, there, there was definitely some parallels there. Um, and I think oh, for anyone, I, I was gonna say for anyone's wonder, I mean, cause you know, the Dalton gang, you know, did operate in Oklahoma a lot, The the James gang did at times and they, they hit out at a robber's cave uh, in Oklahoma. And of course there is um, a lot of legends that, um, uh, they buried quite a bit of treasure in Oklahoma. And some people say, oh, you know, it's just legend. But in 1913 to 1915, Frank James moved to Oklahoma. And this was, and then the same time period, Cole Younger got out of prison and he went down there, the same place. And the story goes, they were trying to find the treasure that they had buried there 30 years before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just that, just the, the mystique of buried treasure is powerful in and of itself. And then mm -hmm. you start adding in these layers, it gets enticing to say the least. Even yeah, just yeah. From, from, a, from a mythological, legendary, historic perspective. There's one other other quote I wanted to uh, run run past you because I just think that it 
it, it was really interesting to me that the social bandits who metaphorically rode out of Missouri and Oklahoma into America at large quickly transcended the specific economic and political conditions of the areas that produced them and became national cultural heroes. The outlaws were ready-made cultural heroes. Their local supporters had already presented them in terms accessible to the nation as a whole. The portrait of the outlaw as a strong man righting his own wrongs and taking his own revenge had a deep appeal to a society concerned with the place of masculinity and masculine virtues in a newly industrialized and seemingly a feat order. Oh, that is interesting. Um, I, I would say that there that, that there's a lot of uh, validity there, uh, particularly the, the quote the ready made, and part of that was because it the mythos of those bandits was ready made. Um, and created specifically by newspaper men, particularly John Edwards. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there, there is, you know, some people would argue that you wouldn't know who Jesse James was if it weren't for John Edwards who um, we ran across a number of times in the dark Ozarks because again, in this time period, you know, it's sits people and smoke and mirrors it seems, but yeah, he would, <laughs> The adjunct to Joe Shelby during the war, and um, of course, and had met and run into the uh, the James brothers during the war as they fought under Quantrell and Bloody Bill Anderson, and then uh, when he returned to the newspaper business, uh, he took up the mantle of basically creating the Robin Hood version of Jesse James. <laughs> and I, I think <clears throat> I th I'm just I'm contemplating on this in terms of the hero impact because there there is something I think especially for little boys there's something very enticing about an outlaw hero the uh, uh, the guy that you know your your aunt or your grandmother might tell you not to be emulating is the very person that you want to to play out. Well, true. And 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 I think also for for at least some little girls that, you know, uh, aren't aren't too girly girly. <laughs> Which is actually an excellent segue to Bell Star. <laughs> Who was girly girly? <laughs> <laughs> at least to begin with. At least. <laughs> Well, and just coming back to was it was it Frank who always carried a, a copy of Shakespeare with him? Yes, and could quote Shakespeare um, very very well. And you think about that just for a moment, and and we see, we do see this. This was one of the 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 argument, one of the arguments that somehow the uh, the James or the the Daltons were um, fighting. Uh, against social classes, et cetera. And it, was, it referenced, of course, uh, the, the James, it referenced Joe Shelby to make note that these were individuals who came from means. In many cases, they were extremely well-educated. And mm -hmm. you, you cannot mm, distill this to the simplicity of class struggle. No, actually a number of them, particularly in that time period and ones that we're talking about, most of them were very well educated and had means. Um, and so it kind of turns that stereotype on its head, really, if, if you know that. And, and just a, a thought to add into that, uh, I, I think it's a, you know, century and change, uh, you know, being removed from from this culture but we were you know when the the rare times that we had photographs it's very easy for a contemporary uh analyst to look at these individuals and they're dressed ruggedly they have you know the you know frontier garb etc and somehow erroneously assume that that these were poor people or these were um uneducated people it's one of the I understand the the dynamic that you you have a, a cultural folk hero 
um, in a liminal space of banditry, et cetera, uh, distilled over generation and generation. And naturally, a, an outcome of that is to think of them as, you know, poorly spoken or poorly educated or, you know, fill in the blank. Right. But it it really speaks to sort of your armchair analyst, I say, as I relax in my armchair, um, your arm, armchair analyst, <laughs> uh, cultural analyst, looking at, for example, contemporary photos from the 1880s and arriving at a lot of incorrect conclusions about these people. These were individuals who, you know, will take um, Myra Shirley Bell. We will take uh, Frank James, just as two examples. Cole Younger, I think you could put him mm -hmm. right in there. Uh, oh, yeah. in individuals, uh, Joe Shelby very much so, although he's not abandoned, but that was thanks to the war. Um, that, you know, that because if you take, if you took Joe Shelby's actions and just moved them five years forward, <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, history would have would have probably remembered him a little bit differently, but um, in individuals who, again, uh, ex extraordinarily articulate, educated, thoughtful individuals who I, I would say that their their um, intelligence led to some of the successes of their exploits and in some cases like like joe shelby uh, and frank to their um longevity yes no I, I i i agree entirely there um and uh you know it's um, a few episodes back when we were discussing joe shelby there's there's one quote of of um, someone uh describing he and his men, you know, riding to Mexico and getting to the Rio Grande. And um, someone said, you know, they could, you know, here came these 600 Missourians and see this you know, you know, man with you know, black hat and plume and, you know, the red beard and he looked like somebody. And I think that's a good summation of a lot of these characters is that, yeah, they looked like someone because they, 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 knew how to carry themselves they knew they knew what they were doing and they were they were intelligent smart people um mm -hmm. or they wouldn't have survived near as long as they did <laughs> no no and they were also living a very dangerous life and so in some cases you know the individuals who didn't survive as long um you know attrition essentially mm -hmm. and then in a very unique american asymmetrical battlefield well put agreed <laughs> and, and 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 i'm specifically thinking of bell star yes um you know, we got to we got just mm, a couple of months ago we were standing outside her house yes her her uh the house she grew up in um mm -hmm. and uh and the funny thing is, you look at that house, and it has an addition on it that's been put on later. That house wasn't that big, um, mm -hmm. but it was the house of one of the largest landowners in the region and mm -hmm. one of the wealthiest men in the region. Um, although you look at that house now, and you, you, most people would look at it and say, oh, that was, you know, a tenant sharecropper or something, you know, because it's a small house. Comparatively uh, speaking, yes. And not, not so at all. And um, then, of course, uh, we've, we've stood in front of where her nest home was on uh, in Carthage on the square that uh, yeah. her father uh, had the uh, Carthage Hotel and they lived there. Mm -hmm. And um, both places, ironically, are haunted. Yes. And, <laughs> and uh, of course, the, the home that we're referencing, is it Red Oak 2? Yes. Uh, just uh, <clears throat> there in, in Jasper County. Fantastic um, Route 66 location. 
And ironically, the house that the Dalton boys grew up in in Oklahoma is there as well. The, the properties are just migrating to Red Oak. <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> it's, like, it's, like the, it's like the house uh, in The Legend of Baba Yaga on Chicken Leg. <laughs> they, they, just, they just get up one day and walk to Red Oak. Uh, I think Lowell would be proud. <laughs> Yes, he would. But uh, but seriously, so you have both of those, you know, the, the houses that the Dalton boys and Bell Star grew up in sitting right there and both of them with activity. But uh, yes, it's in. And, and I think what you said about seeing pictures, etc. Uh, I think that's very deceptive, too. And, and I think in Bell's case, it really is because most of the photos, at least that I've seen, are a little later in her life. Although she died at 42, she you know died young, shot in the back. Mm -hmm. um, um, now uh, a neighbor, uh, and I forget his name, was um, charged and, and convicted and actually executed for her uh, murder, but. There, there are so many questions about whether he really did it. It is still listed as unsolved. Um, and it was over a, a dance, actually. But uh, And where, whereabouts was that? Uh, in Oklahoma, um, I'm trying to, she had a ranch um, and uh, she had gone to a dance and had danced with the, 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 this neighbor fella and um, uh, he asked to uh, her to, for another hand, uh, and uh, she declined, and then danced with a, a sharecropper. And the story went, he was mad that she wouldn't dance with him again, and he followed her home and shot her. And he was convicted, but then so many people doubt that, that most people say, now we really don't know if he did or not. Um, but uh, so most of the photos are from that time period and she looks fairly rough at that point. I mean, she had, unfortunately, she had lived a pretty rough life um, from the time she was 14 on. Yes. And, you know, one of the things, because we're often talking about Bell Star uh, in relationship to the Missouri Ozarks, Mm -hmm. and, and especially in relationship to a very young career, uh, the essentially teenage um, spy courier um, during the Civil War. But you, mm -hmm. you move into her, her later career when she is an adult um, and it is figuring heavily and heavily involves Oklahoma and, of course, the Oklahoma Ozarks. What are some, uh, in terms of that aspect of her essentially outlaw career, what are some really standout moments for you that, that resonate in terms of this personality? Well, of course, she, she married Henry Starr. And um, now Henry uh, robbed one of the banks at Coffeeville as well uh, as the, the, the Daltons attempted to. Um, but she had, she had been involved in some of the robberies, et cetera. And Judge Parker at Fort Smith uh, got a bee in his bonnet. He, he wanted to put them in prison. And they, the marshals and the prosecutor, which is uh, one of the Clayton brothers, and we've discussed him in the past, um, were really focusing on trying to build a case against them. And uh, the story goes that Bell actually paid someone to kill Clayton at a county fair, um, but then found out that they had issued a warrant for her arrest and that Bass Reeves had the warrant. Mm. And rumor went that she called off the hit on Clayton 
at that point. Eventually, now one of the articles that, that we had tonight actually say that she was never convicted of anything. Now that's not exactly true. Judge Parker sent her to prison, uh, federal prison in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And after she got out of prison, she bought a ranch in Oklahoma. <laughs> Oh, and it's, mm. but you know, the, the sort of the, the counterpoint too is you have, you know, um, not only was she uh, wealthy, but she, she was, uh, you know, she was a debutante, spoke multiple languages, played multiple instruments, et cetera. And you had the side of her as the bandit queen, but she was also a mother, um, her daughter, Pearl, and her, her son, Bud, and they referred to him as Bud, you know, which was her brother who was killed in the war. Um, and um, uh, and I, I like that dichotomy um, mm -hmm. because she fits the mold of the social bandit, but yet she was a mother. Mm -hmm. But, but, think, but again, most of the photos that you see of her in later in life, she looks pretty rough. And so people would look at that and not, and I think probably not assume that she had the background that she did. Very true. And, you know, again, I think that's a, it's a, it's a common theme that I'm excited that we're exploring on tonight's episode is the misconceptions, the unspoken misconceptions that arise around these characters. Mm hmm. I, I agree. Um, I think that Belle is more complicated than most people assume. Um, and in some ways, she she I mean, she's well known, but she doesn't quite have um, the reputation of, say, even Calamity Jane or Annie Oakley. And I think Partly because, again, as you said, she died fairly early. And, and, <clears throat> and before the traveling, like the Western shows and stuff, you know. That's exactly what I was going to say before uh, having the opportunity to uh, do something that I'm sure is not uniquely American, but certainly is a unique expression of Americanism. The idea that you get out of prison and then you go on the road playing yourself for vaudeville. Pretty much so, you know, the, you know, Buffalo Bills, um, Wild West shows and so forth, which of course they took to Europe too. So, yeah, I mean, when you say, yeah, you know, it, it wasn't uniquely American, it was American, but the Europeans relished in it too. <laughs> and, and, and I think that there's a, you know, that, that, that interesting through line uh, of mm, culture, history, folk art, bombast, free enterprise, capitalism, anything for a buck, whatever goes. That yeah. It is, it's sometimes easy to, you know, get disdainful about it when you see it on parade today. But it has an incredibly long lineage in terms of making up our culture and something that you see not inconsistently is taking turns into the extraordinary macabre, extraordinarily macabre aspects uh, when a, an outlaw uh, meets their end and then their corpse is put on display for a nickel of view. Very, very true. Very true. And that, I mean, that happened quite a bit. And in part, uh, for two reasons. One, to prove that it really was them. And yes. then for people who didn't know who they were, or didn't know them to know, to recognize them, um, to see what this, this notorious person really looked like. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, that morbid curiosity is the same thing as during the same time period, people going to public execution, public hangings, you know, you, you take the Very, family and a picnic basket. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Come still on, that's that. the kids. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm still planning mine out in terms of the menu. 
Um, <laughs> You know, and and also, you know, all all of those things, and then reaching this apex, and it's also an opportunity for the local drugstore to pay off their, you know, their debt. True. <laughs> <laughs> Look, honey, we can finally get a new roof. Uh, <laughs> and at the rate they're coming in, we only need to be doing this for maybe another twelve hours. Exactly, but you know, and. What amazes me with that, though, is that how long that went on. I mean, you know, that that happened with the Depression era gangsters as well, you know. It did. It's a, I, I'm I'm just off on my own little tangent, but I'm, I'm imagining, you know, the, the owner of the local business trying to figure out how to uh, get word to the next town to hobble the horse temporarily that's carrying the court injunction against the display. <laughs> Well, that's the thing is that for at that time period, uh, you know, a lot of times there really wasn't one. <laughs> yeah. Just the injunction came when it got too smelly, I think. <laughs> <laughs> the crowds aren't coming in anymore for the flies. Right. It's, and it, again, I think it, you know, mm, part, part of the, Mm, complex magic of the of the American West and such a great deal of the American West of the mythos of the American West was created in the Ozarks mm -hmm. that much of that complexity we we experience bits and pieces of it enough to find it alluring in in various ways or interesting or vicarious but at the end of the day uh this was a really, to put it bluntly, a really weird moment in Western civilization. It, it, I mean, it, it really was. Um, but in some ways, it's kind of a very honest moment, too. Very. I mean, and, and, and um, mm, oh, uh, I'll, I'll explain my thought structure on this, but weird in the sense that in, in many cases, the individuals who were at the fringes of American settlement were, as we've noted before, often individuals of considerable means. They were often uh, highly educated, highly intellectual in, in terms of their, their reading and their, their forewithal. But they were also moving to these fringes because of their you know, desire for a variety of things, obviously to exploit natural resources for their own gain, yes. And, uh, you know, I say that um, lovingly uh, because that's what we do. Uh, we want to, you know, do well at what we do. Um, but there was there was also a driving force of the, the virtues of individualism and the virtues of survival and the virtues of, you know, the, these elements uh, that that the bandits, the social bandits, really ultimately mm, manifested or expressed in a in a unique way into larger society, but that are mm, American virtues, American ideals. They they did not want to be under somebody's thumb and structured and et cetera, et cetera. They they wanted to be mm, at the at the fringe, at the edge where they could make a name for themselves, where they could create something new, where in some cases they could, for lack of a better word, term, um, feel as though they were truly being themselves and, and expressing themselves in, and those at, at the same time uh, were doing so at the, in some cases, the edges of survival at the edges of endurance at the edges of uh of having um material in terms of you know the that for example um belsar's father um wealthy landowner but the building you look at it today it's not the hermitage um, no it's not mount vernon the the infrastructure resources simply were not there to do that and i'm assuming based on the decisions of many of these individuals, they were okay with that because they knew that was the price they had to pay to be themselves in this space. 
I think so. And with the idea that over time, they they could develop that 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 small house would become the bigger house, etc. And mm -hmm. in his case, he did end up owning basically the north side of the Carthage Square with all the buildings. You know, so yeah. he, he he did do that. Um, yeah. And I I think building on what you said, I think part of an unspoken part of this recognition of of these people that maybe tacitly some people don't want to admit is they looked at the in the same time contemporarily and also in retrospect look at some of these people the situations that they were in and came out of um and there's a i think for a lot of people they don't want to admit it but you at least a, a silent recognition that these people came out of situations like the Civil War uh, and being branded outlaws and basically left with little uh, legitimate means of, of uh, supporting yourself. Mm -hmm. And right or wrong, as far as the law goes, they survived and more than survived where most people wouldn't have. And I think that is something that Americans admire. Um, yeah. And today, people ogle the same way over billionaires. That's very and, true. And in some ways, what's the difference? Mm -hmm. <laughs> very, very true. <laughs> It's it does it really helps to create that sense of perspective, and you know, and it's it is a it is definitely a a continuation of a theme. I'm curious if this is as true in other cultures as it is in American culture, but in certainly in American culture, we love a winner. Mm -hmm. Well, and we love a winner, and we love social mobility. Um, and, and let's face mm -hmm. it. Coming out of Europe, traditionally, there was, you, gen, from 99.99% of the people, there, there really was not any opportunity for social mobility. Yes. And so we, 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 we have always um, applauded that in America. And then when you have someone who does it despite Despite all of those circumstances that they're in, whether you agree how they got there or not, I mean, implicitly, there's a nod of, you know, they made it, they they got through, they figured out a way where most people wouldn't have. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And it's it's powerful. It's very, in a weird sense, it's deeply inspiring. Yes, um, uh, it's very complicated. <laughs> <Let's just say. laughs> Which <clears throat> I want to, I want to. We'll come back to the Marlowe brothers in a moment. But speaking of complicated, I want to segue directly into John Wilkes Booth in Oklahoma. Yes. <laughs> uh, this is this was news to me, but. I, I think it's it's appropriate when you take into consideration the uh, you know the 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 extraordinarily heightened emotions involved with Lincoln's assassination, the mm, swift retribution that took place afterwards, or a apparently swift retribution, mm -hmm. and then the uh, weird. <sighs> Definitely not in the sense of Jesse James uh, as a folk hero, because uh, I don't really think that we see Booth in any of those in any of that light, but as a folk figure uh, mm -hmm. with essentially his own conspiracy theories that uh, um, just crop up at various times and cause certain levels of perplexity. Well, and and I think uh, aside from the fact that. Uh, Americans tend to do that with a lot of prominent people who die in odd ways. Um, 
there, 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 there actually were, there are some facts that I think kind of propelled this idea that Booth survived and went west and lived a long life, et cetera. Um, one is that the way he was killed in the barn, um, specifically there had been orders not to kill him. Mm -hmm. And one soldier just started shooting and it ended up being a soldier that they think actually had Southern empathy. And so that started stories that you know that this was a cover, and there there were um, there were uh, accounts that um, the body did not match uh, his medical records, etc. Um, and so you had the you had these ideas floating around that maybe they did not really get him, um, and. Um, so it, it leaves the possibility of people ruminating about this and then people, you know, making claims that they are that person, you know, years later or on their deathbed, which not only happened with him, but Jesse Jane, I mean, all kinds of, I mean, you had people who claimed later that they were Billy the Kid and Jesse James, et cetera. So, um, I mean, it's kind of like um, Anastasia. You yes. Know, the robot, you know, uh, and you did have someone who who impersonated her for decades and, and and fooled a lot of people at royal courts in Europe who were related to the Romanovs, um, mm -hmm. and that that she, you know, it, she was not her. So. And I think, first of all, it, it, mm, it speaks to a very interesting aspect of mm, mental state and celebrity impersonation. Mm -hmm. they, and and I, I don't have the complex background necessary to decipher the mental state that would make someone want to do that. But it's not terribly uncommon or simply the desire for fame or the desire for attention mm -hmm. is in, in some instances extremely alluring and in a in an earlier era where it was much easier to hide it was also much easier to pretend yes we you know um it's much harder to um have that off the grid presence now and 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 not leave a it's much harder not to have a, a paper trail etc um and and i and i think for a lot of people a lot of people don't even realize how much different it is now versus then in those regards i mean a lot of people didn't have birth certificates or anything else so um mm -hmm. they could reimagine their story and so if you were inclined to do so for whatever reason you know people did but yes so yes there's this theory that John Wilkes Booth lived out his life in Oklahoma <laughs> and and as with all great and perplexing conspiracy theories it's difficult to for sure say that that didn't happen there's all you know I get you know uh you know, as far as I know, they've never done DNA testing um, on on Booth's remains, and I'm not sure what actually happened with his remains after. But, I'm, I'm not either. Come to think of it, and that might be an opening of someone being able to do this if they, you know, really can't be found. So mm -hmm. now the the reference that I have um, says that. The, the man purported to be Booth, uh, his body actually was embalmed and put on display until it disappeared yes. decades later. Yes, yes, it, it was put on display for public viewing um, and claimed to be Booth. Um, 
a lot of that happened. A lot of the, a lot of those kind of things seemed to happen in Oklahoma, actually. They did. They really did. <laughs> It makes me worry to do investigations over there. I don't know, I might end up in somebody's branches. Just don't, just don't uh, die or get bombed in Oklahoma. We're teasing. Yes, we are teasing. Uh, <laughs> now, I, I, I handed it uh, at, uh, you know, two John Wayne references. The first, of course, is True Grit. Um, the first, and of course, there's two films. Uh, one with John Wayne and uh, the uh, what looks like the Canadian Rockies are standing in for Oklahoma in that film. I'm not exactly sure where it was filmed, but it certainly wasn't Oklahoma, even though that's where the, the Arkansas and Oklahoma is where the book, the original novel by Portis is based. And then the second film, which is by the Coen brothers, isn't it? Uh, I'm not sure if the Coen brothers produced it, but Jeff Bridges was, you know, played the lead. Yes, and I, I love it. The soundtrack is fantastic. And, uh, you know, I think it was shot in northern Texas. It definitely has much more of a, of a, of a regional vibe to it. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it does appear much more realistic for the the setting of where it's supposed to be and it's it's a phenomenal film highly recommend mm -hmm. it um, yeah at, to be perfectly honest i like it better than the original i do too uh i do too although i love john wayne but yeah I, and i do well, like the original but well i have mixed feelings about the original <laughs> but i do like I, john wayne <laughs> yeah i mean i'll say this i, I growing up I, I liked the original, uh, and when they announced that they were doing the remake, you know, I, you know, I hoped that it would be good. And my opinion is, they knocked it out of the ballpark. I I agree. It actually makes me want to. I have it on DVD and may put it in later tonight, just because. <laughs> but as as far as as films, there's a very unique Oklahoma connection with a great John Wayne film. Uh, the mm -hmm. Sons of Katie Elder. Yes, yes, and and it just and it's really a great story in a lot of ways. Um, that kind of turns a lot of these um, cliches on their on its head. I think so, and of course we're we're talking about the the tragedy that took place in regards to the Marlowe family. Yes, and. When when we say that it inspired the, the film The Sons of Katie Elder, very loosely, um, mm -hmm. the uh, there was a there was a biography written in in regards to the the Marlowe brothers, and in in eighteen ninety two and in the nineteen fifties, uh, Hollywood purchased the, uh, the 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 rights and then ultimately made the sons of katie elder with john wayne yeah. and dean martin <clears throat> mm -hmm. but they uh they changed a lot <laughs> yeah they they did um but what i find very interesting is one that um you you can't just categorize the Marlowe brothers as you know white hat or black hat. Um, That's a good point. It it is I guess in a, in a in a real sense it's a very realistic story that that doesn't have quite the mythos or the social bandit aspect so much. Um, there's there's a lot of what I would classify as terror, survival, and pragmatism. Yes, and and I, I think this is the only story that I know of that the um, the prisoners not only thwarted a you know lynching mob, uh, mm -hmm. but ran them off twice. 
Yes. <laughs> it, there's, there's some confusing aspects to this. The, mm, the, 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 the general take or my general take is that the various members of the of various of the brothers of the Marlowe brothers um, may or may not but probably didn't commit the crimes that they were being arrested for. Yeah, that that's my that's my take. I mean, we really don't know. Um because of everything that happened afterwards that those questions really never got sorted out but mm -hmm. you know they were you know they were being arrested for you know um stealing horses if i remember right um and uh they and, and they they were from oklahoma they were oklahoma sons um but they ended up in in uh basically in texas and um, uh, had gotten arrested um, see, before the brothers got arrested originally, if I remember right. And um, they were in jail. And basically, one of the um, landowners got a, a posse together, and it included the city attorney. <laughs> jail guards etc to basically break them out of jail and lynch them mm -hmm. and they basically got a hold of weapons in the jail and fought the mob off <laughs> yeah <laughs> and we, we don't have the documentation on this but i know we, we messaged about this a little bit earlier prior to the episode but i'm going to go out on a limb and say that in some way, shape, or form, they had direct Welsh ancestry, and or I'm, drawing, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm drawing. I'm drawing from two points on this to, to make my case very okay. prematurely. Uh, one, their puckish sense of survival. Um, two, their kinship, and three, one of the brothers who went by the name of Ep uh, as a nickname. His actual name was Llewellyn. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's very that's very possible. Um, but it, 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 they, they definitely come off as, you know, coming out of a Celtic honor culture um, mm. and, and clannish. And then um, let's see. Um, one of the brothers escaped. Um, see, that was Boone. And they kept trying to find him. He ultimately comes back to to represent them to make their plead their case and gets arrested. Um, but in between, they uh, decide to move them to another jail, and um, they get ambushed at Dry Creek, and it becomes known as the Dry Creek ambush or massacre, and by a by a mob, it ends up looking like some of the guards that are moving the prisoners are involved and throw mm -hmm. weapons to the mob and the, again the city attorney who was at the first um mob is there and uh, giving orders to the brother they're shackled together two brothers to two brothers two of them get killed each shackled to another brother and ultimately the brother the living brothers to survive and then to fight off the mob have to hack off their dead brother's foot yes in order to separate themselves because they were shackled together they were shackled together and and each of the, of the ones that were still alive had been wounded at this point yes and so they had to do that to then fight off the mob and um, and the long and short of it is um, a number of the members of the mob were ultimately found guilty of crimes. The Marlowe family uh, sued and, and was awarded 
damages for the loss of life of the brothers who were killed. And the two surviving brothers ultimately then moved to Colorado. Can't imagine why they didn't want to stay. Um, and became model citizens and actually became law enforcement officers. Yes. I, and when I read that, I'm like, you know, I don't blame him for the last part. Mm -mm. No, <laughs> I really don't at that point. No. <laughs> the best protection possible. We're going to move out of state and we're going to become police. Um, yep. In that regard, I love this in, the, in 1891, uh, uh, after sentencing mob members for their part of the attack, federal judge A.P. McCormick had this quote. Uh, this is the first time in the annals of history where unarmed prisoners shackled together ever repelled a mob. Such cruel courage that preferred to fight against such great odds and die, if at all, in glorious battle, rather than die ignominiously by a frenzied mob, deserves to be commemorated in song and story. Which, again, I guess, is the definition of social bandits. Yeah. I, I we just so. don't know whether or not they were really guilty of what they were accused of. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, to me, their, their story just really speaks to, again, uh, a sense of Celtic kinship and a sense of pragmatism and response or reaction in the face of mm, increasing odds. Mm -hmm. that uh, and, and, a, and a story of survival and tragedy that it is certainly in, in our time and place and you know, it does have mm, strong elements of the social banditry. In this particular case, they did not have the support of the, of the community. It was the community that was trying to kill them. That's, that's true. I mean, that, that, that is true. So. But, but as a, you know, a, a, a definite through line is their story in, in perhaps a, an unanticipated or offbeat way, injecting itself into the, the, the public consciousness of the popular consciousness, the Americana consciousness with a, a film, a 1965 film, that most people who watch that film have no idea that it is in some way inspired by the original events. That's true. Um, yeah, you would not know that it's based on on true events. So, um, and I, I think that for me, you know, it, it really speaks to. Um, just the sort of the character of, of, of the of the person, you know, coming through that the way they did and and fighting as the judge noted, and and perhaps it's either either was extremely uh, extreme hubris or indication that they were innocent that the older brother came to represent them, and then yeah. ended up in jail. For his efforts so um mm -hmm. but arrested by the same people that were in the mob correct so yeah. i'm currently leaning toward their innocence yes i mean actually i mean it in some ways it it, it has a, a little bit of overtone of lincoln county wars in new mexico and billy the kid um mm -hmm. it, sounding and um, in fact um, another Oklahoma boy um, that's in the readings for this week was Frank Waite who left Oklahoma to become a cowboy and ended up in Lincoln County working for John Tunstall mm. who, <laughs> who was killed by by the uh, basically the large cattlemen in the area and his employees then rode against them, including Billy the Kid. And then, yeah. but Frank Waite survived and um, was a law abiding citizen for the rest of his life, much like the surviving Marlowe brothers. It's, mm, 
inter almost like interlocking circles in terms of the the individuals involved and the um, just the the experience something that um i want to i want to talk about that involves some paranormal aspects just briefly or maybe not so briefly is for gibson yes uh and i'm looking forward to making it out to port gibson soon i've not been there uh but you have and have had some interesting mm -hmm. interesting experiences as well yes um Fort Gibson is, is very, it, it, it's very interesting. It was a very early frontier fort um, established in the 1820s. Um, and when it was established, it really was on the frontier. And basically it guarded the um, sort of the southwestern edge of the Ozarks. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you had some interesting names go through there, um, including Jefferson Davis. It was his first station out of West Point. Um, and the remains of the building that um, he worked in are still there. Um, you, you just don't, you know, we, we have all these conceptions of the Civil War, but again, most, most of these leaders, even on the Confederate side, were Union officers. And he, he was, he was there in the early 1830s. So, um, and it saw a lot of, um, a lot of activity before the Civil War and during the Civil War. Um, actually, it was, um, the southern end of the supply train uh, from Fort Scott, Kansas, and from points in southwest Missouri. So um, a lot of the bushwhackers in southwest Missouri um, and partisan rangers that uh, whose job was to uh, disrupt Union movements uh, uh, spent their time uh, attacking the supply trains going to Fort Gibson. And it was the, the, mm, the Arkansas River, the Burgess River, and the, the Grand, Grand Rivers converge mm -hmm. pretty much at that point. So in terms of river navigation um, from that point, and then supply chain, uh, overland supply chain to that point, this was... <sighs> This was a, an incredibly important location. Yes, in fact, there, there were there were there were skirmishes even with Quantrell, right through there, um, and um, where the the armies, uh, where the army and the uh, Confederates would fight across the rivers. And. <clears throat> And tell me a little bit about your experience at Fort Gibson. My own experience was that that some of the buildings have a lot of energy or a, a lot of heaviness, um, and you just there there are a couple in particular you just really felt like you were walking through points in time, if that makes sense. Um, I did not have a personal paranormal experience, but the rangers there are pretty open uh, talking about what happens there, which you don't get at a lot of the, the uh, parts. But they talked openly about uh, seeing apparitions at times, um, hearing voices. Uh, but the the one the story that um, moved me the most, and and I heard this from two different rangers, is that at times they there's there's an open big open field um, in one part of the fort, and that um, they will look out there at night if someone's there at night and there are phantom campfires and 
they've seen images of the tents and it's just images of an encampment, including the fires, et cetera. And the first fellow who told me, I thought, okay, he's embellishing. You know, he came across as someone that he's embellishing. And then uh, later in the day, in another part of, of the fort, um, talked to someone else, and he gave a very similar account. But he did not. Re- he came a- across as just being very, you know, straightforward and and, and straight laced about it. So, and I did not get the idea he was embellishing. Um, and so, they they really painted the scene of. Uh, of seeing this and they said there'd be sometimes they will do night events and um, that you can just look out and it's almost as if you see uh, encampment that's all slightly translucent mm. which is both really cool and really creepy all at the same time exactly <laughs> I like it. I like it, it a lot. It's very, it's very interesting. And it, another thing is that it's actually a fort that it it straddled um, the old west, and that it it was in use to I think the eighteen nineties, if I remember right, or or um, very near, yes. Yes. Yeah. So key location for the for the US military. Yeah, where, whereas a lot of the forts uh, in this region after the Civil War were decommissioned, it continued for decades later. Mm-hmm. That's, I think, I'm, the more we talk about it, the more I'm like, I've got to get over there. I, yeah, I want to get back. It's been, it's been a number of years since I've been down there, but it's really, it's really neat. I would encourage anyone if you get the opportunity to check it out. And and even just the many of the locations that we're talking about in the eastern uh, eastern Oklahoma, which is the western Ozarks, are extraordinarily beautiful. Mm-hmm. It is it is a very pretty country. It really is. Mm. Okay. So, what do we want to talk about next? I oh, want to talk about the. Uh... Underhill? <laughs> oh, our Depression era gangsters, uh, William Underhill Jr., born on March 16th, 1901. And, uh, In Joplin, Missouri. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and died at the age of 32. Mm-hmm. And is the, uh, and we get to talk about Jay Edgar again. Um, he basically is the reason that the FBI instituted field offices. What is your, there's, there's a, a couple of key quotes that really jumped out to me about Underhill. But the one that, um, he uh, began to show a certain amount of interesting behavior that his mother said was the result of a childhood accident that, quote, didn't leave him quite right. Well, it made me kind of think of Jody Hamilton. Yeah. <laughs> in Texas County, who mm-hmm. was kicked in the, in the head by a mule as a kid. So it does make you wonder if perhaps, you know, maybe he did have a closed head injury because, um, I mean, there were violent criminals in in that time period, Mm -hmm. ruthless, cold. I mean, you know, Dillinger, Clyde Barrow, Pretty Boy Floyd, et cetera. And then there was Wilbur Underhill who, just really just was one step beyond that in a lot of ways so it does make you wonder if if he didn't have a closed head injury or something that which generally will modify personality and accentuate certain traits uh, and usually ends up either being violence or being over sexualized one of the two and Mm -hmm. and uh, 
the descriptions of of him and just how far he would go uh, to uh, get away, et cetera, uh, made you wonder. Um, and I mean, there, there is a reason that, you know, his nickname was the Tri-State Terror and it, because of all of his activity in Missouri, Kansas, and Oklahoma. Um, and, um, and basically he was so ruthless that um, they basically created a, an office for the FBI in Oklahoma City to pursue him. And um, I mean, and I, and I mentioned it before we started tonight, but they even went as far as, I think almost villainizing him even more than they had to, if that's even possible, um, by doing things like um, when they, um, at one of his trials, because he was, I mean, he was sentenced to life imprisonment twice, I believe. He kept escaping. Mm -hmm. um, but um, they had uh, psychologists testifying uh, and evaluating him based on phrenology. And this is in the mid 20s when it already had pretty much been uh, debunked as invalid. Um, and phrenology, for anyone who doesn't know, is the, quote, the science of attributing character traits to your physical traits. Yes. Yes. So, and yes. basically a form of eugenics, um, which, if you're curious, just go google it and yeah. and go from take there you to a nasty nasty trail that ends in 1930s germany if you have any idea there so, um uh, and uh, and has some uniquely american cross ties yeah it was basically it well it was created in america so mm -hmm. <laughs> yes it was it's yeah, it here. sometimes those things get a little close to home Yes. And, uh, my my introduction to phrenology actually comes from an episode of the Muppet Show. I think I must have missed that one. There is a very brief skit in which <laughs> Fozzie Bear has has uh, put together his new vaudeville moment, and he uh, um, mm, apprehends Kermit in the middle of the show and announces that his uh, his new talent is phrenology. Uh, Kermit inquires, and uh, and Fozzie says that it's <laughs> the art of telling the future of someone by feeling the bumps on their head, and uh, then proceeds to uh, <laughs> run his fuzzy bare hands over uh, um, uh, Kermit's um, plastic eyes. <laughs> and so Kermit runs him off the stage. So, so just a little creepy, yeah. Just a just a smidge, but I think there there is a a, a comparative point uh, that I can't help but make in regards to between Underhill and mm -hmm. Billy Cook. Mm -hmm. And the the point is, you know, he's born in 1901. In 1918, uh, he's convicted of burglary and. He sent to the Missouri State Penitentiary for five years, beginning at the age of 17. Boy, that does sound familiar. Doesn't it? And I would mm, at least lightly conjecture that his experience uh, five years in, uh, in the Missouri State Penitentiary in Jefferson City probably had more to do with, uh, with what happened afterwards than phrenology. That's very likely, um, you know, and the counterpoint to Billy Cook would probably support that. So um, what, whatever might have 
not been right after the childhood accident probably was a lot less right after that mm -hmm. uh, but um it's kind of funny that, um, or ironic that he's not as well known now as some of the, some of the other um, criminals of the day. And I think, in part, he he there never was a a romanticization, uh, you know, of him. Uh, or his deeds where, you know, pretty boy Floyd was seen as dashing and could be generous and this and that. And of course, Bonnie and Clyde have developed that, that mystique and John Dillinger, et cetera. But Underhill was really just, you know, at, to be honest, probably more successful as a criminal than most of they them. I, well. I would agree. <clears throat> you know, we, we talked about something, and this is going to sound flippant, but I don't think it is. We talked about uh, the fact that America loves a winner. Yeah, you know, America loves to vicariously experience the, uh, you know, certain traits of rugged individualism and these types of mm -hmm. things. Um, in terms of folk heroes and outlaws and celebrities, America also loves very attractive people. True, true. And and uh, um, I think to a, to a large degree, um, Bonnie and Clyde, literally, Pretty Boy Floyd, the James Gang. Uh, et cetera. These were these were people John. that the American public enjoyed looking at. I mean, that's true. I mean, you know, and certainly an argument could be made that Bonnie and Clyde were not, you know, were not as attractive, but it was the rest of the story that became attractive, the the romance and, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, sort of the, that uh, you know. fatalistic romance that <laughs> Americans are drawn to as well. But, you know, certainly like John Dillinger was, you know, movie star, good looks, and mm -hmm. people responded to it. And, you know, we we had the, uh, either the benefit or the, uh, mm, uh, the perceptual liability of, of viewing Bonnie and Clyde through the lens of uh, Faye Dunaway and Warren Beatty. Yes. And so, as 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 people after the movie started looking at the story, it's filtered through that. Yes, it is. But I, but something that I think that you mentioned that is incredibly powerful is the the romanticized aspect of their um, their love, their romantic uh, experience while on the run. Yes, and that that's something that made that uh, more of a unique story. Um, where some of the other gangsters, they certainly had love in interests or wives or whatever. Um, it wasn't quite the same as both being on the run that way. And then, of course, you know, Bonnie was married to another man the whole time, etc. So it, it's that that um, forbidden fruit aspect, etc. That people are intrigued by it's it's very salacious and it sells newspapers and it gets people talking and uh of course it was um wilbur underhill's uh desperate attempt to successfully honeymoon that ended up getting him killed that's true that is ironic you know that is ironic that that aspect could have made it more of that romanization but it did. It ultimately, it didn't. He was on his honeymoon when he was <laughs> found in the end and and uh, ultimately shot and killed. I know. I mean, he was shot five times and ran another sixteen blocks. That's adrenaline. Uh, yes, before breaking into a furniture store and collapsing on one of their beds. Yes. <laughs> 
but I do think that um, the the tenor that I get is that I think people were were so afraid of of him at this point mm -hmm. that they just decided that boy it's just better to, that he's gone you know no matter mm -hmm. what all the circumstances and you and, you see that like various figures various characters in some cases the exploits begin to resonate and in others, it is just we we wanted to end. Um, we we just want to we want the person out of commission. We don't care whether it's prison or a grave. We just need this to stop. And you know, I, I think you know, I'm going to draw just a comparison back to here in Taney County, but the secrecy and then the romanticization that we see with the bald knobbers. Uh, as opposed to Alf Boland, where the county just celebrated that he was dead. Yes, and and I think I think you, I think there was that aspect to it. I really do. Um, and um, I am. Um, I'm also. And you didn't have the benefit of it, but I, I also had reference for um, a book by um, R.D. Morgan, The Tri-State Terror, The Life and Crimes of Wilbur Underhill. And it's yeah. um, uh, interesting point talking about just that is that he was um, one of the murders he was tried for actually was in Ottawa County, uh, Oklahoma, Miami. Mm -hmm. And um, the uh, prosecutor um just openly stated um that he he had killed he had killed a man in a in a robbery and um that uh, he just openly say that he intended on playing uh placing underhill's ass in old sparky the name for the oklahoma's uh electric chair come hell or high water <laughs> which is not a statement that you would hear today but <laughs> no. i can appreciate it though i i just i do want to i do want to briefly interject how much i appreciate the fact that you just casually do have a book on this subject <laughs> oh, my, my my library is a little macabre but but <laughs> Now, an interesting point in this is during the trial, and this may have a tri you know, contributed to the prosecutor's uh, demeanor in making this statement, that um, while the trial was going on at key points, multiple times um, that um, Wilbur Underhill's mother would uh, feign a, a, an attack and flop out of her chair to disrupt the proceedings. <laughs> <sighs> you do what you got to do. I, I found a, an interesting aspect of this. Underhill's fiance, Hazel Jarrett Hudson, was a sister of the outlaw uh, Jarrett brothers. And as a part of the wedding present for Hazel, Underhill and several others robbed a bank in Frankfort, Kentucky. <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> As you do. As you do, you know. He's got to show his girl how he really feels. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow it just did not come off as romantic as Bonnie and Clyde. No. <laughs> Although they apparently were trying really hard. Yes. Maybe and maybe they, they were trying too hard. I'm not sure. That that may be that may be the case. Um, but it is interesting because you have, I mean, the 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 story um, of Underhill's life is as intricate and compelling as any of these others. Um, mm -hmm. and the fact that it is, it's very interesting how capricious and arbitrary it is of what we end up selecting as a, as a society to remember and not. It is. 
it is. And sometimes it makes sense, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's just, as you mentioned, it is extremely capricious in terms of who gets remembered as folk hero. I think with uh, with the James uh, gang, I think with the, uh, particularly James gang, additionally, the, the Dalton brothers, there, there are elements in their story that mm, really contribute the, the key building blocks to logically supporting their mythos. But then in other cases, it's anybody's guess. That that's true. I mean, it's you know, um, kind of you know, it anyone's guess. And but I I do want to mention, it's kind of interesting that um, Underhill, he also his his partner through a lot of his crimes, at least until until about the last year of his life, because his partner ended up in prison was Harvey Bailey. Yes. Harvey Bailey is kind of interesting. Um, he is. Um, boy. My most striking takeaway is that he closely resembles Mr. Drysdale from the Beverly Hillbillies. He did, you know, I I had never thought about it, but he, he, he does look a lot like that. <laughs> <laughs> and and Harvey, uh, he, you know, he originally was, I think, from West Virginia, but he ended up in Missouri and Oklahoma during this time period. And he and Underhill uh, worked together and had a gang. And uh, I, I think it's fair to say that Harvey probably was the brains of the operation. Um, but he ended up going to prison um going to Alcatraz he was one of the first um uh prisoners at Alcatraz and was there for a number of years um and it seems that after Harvey went to prison things kind of started unraveling a bit for Underhill but it it is kind of interesting too that um and again, it's the interconnectedness um, that at one point, Harvey Bailey was holed up on a ranch the same time that Machine Gun Kelly um, had kidnapped a million an oilman, millionaire, Urschel, uh, for ransom. Uh, but they were on the same ranch and didn't know each other was there. And Bailey was not involved, ironically. Uh, and and, and another thing is that Bailey and Underhill at one point were suspected of being involved in the Kansas City massacre. Mm. And, part, and partly, I think, because Bailey was frequented Joplin a lot and the massacre was planned in Joplin by um, Deffy um, Farmer, who had a large safe house here for gangsters. Uh, ironically, um, Farmer tried to, once his connection was came out, he tried to frame Mara Barker and her boys for being involved. Mm. And he grew up with Ma Barker, ironically, in Webb City, Missouri. <laughs> and um, that didn't work. And then for a while, they suspected that Harvey uh, and Underwood were involved. Uh, but they they weren't, and um, Farmer ended up in Alcatraz also, um, um, actually a little before Bailey, uh, for his involvement. And then, ironically, years later, after Deffy Farmer dies, Harvey Bailey marries his widow, and they both lived in Joplin until they died in the 70s and 80s. Which is rapidly getting us into that space of, um, hmm, we throw around the term modern era, but I mean, this is getting close enough to touch, basically, in terms it of- It is, and, and uh, whereas Underhill was the tri-state terror, his partner, Harvey Bailey, was the, the 
dean of American bank robbers. That was what he was known as. And he yeah. was also one of the most successful. He, uh, he got away with over a million dollars during mm -hmm. the 20s and early 30s, um, which would equate to, you know, four or five million now. Um, and, um, but he lived a, a long life after he got out of prison. Yeah, age 91. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, which is impressive all the way around. It, 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 really, it really is, it really is. So um, it does kind of make you, it, it's almost, it makes you wonder in a little different aspect, but the dichotomy between their personalities is, reminds me of Jesse and Frank James. That's a really good point. I, I, I can really appreciate that observation. You know, and mm -hmm. um, I think Har Harvey and Frank both seem to be moderating forces. And when, when they were removed from the situation, that's when things went downhill for the other ones. Mm -hmm. and, and I think we see something similar in regards to Quantrill and then the men around him. Yes, very much so. That's agreed. Oh, that's we have covered a lot. Yeah, we have. <laughs> and there's still there, there's a lot more that can be covered on the subject, which I'm sure we'll revisit at some point. Yes, absolutely. But uh, that may be a good place to wind up. And we want to remind everyone not to forget to check out upcoming events, merchandise at darkozarts.com and paranormalsciencelab.com. Thank you again to Always Buying Books and Beard Engine Brewing Company for helping to bring the Dark Ozarks to everyone. On the next episode, we are going to be discussing healing plants, witchcraft, and shamanism. Catch the Dark Ozarks podcast on Branson Podcast Network, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, Substack, or just about any other podcast platform. Thank you, everyone. And remember, there are no easy answers in the Dark Ozarks.